I guess I should start by introducing myself. I'm, I'm Randy Stafford. I'm a citizen of Jefferson County. I'm 56 years old. Um, I've lived in Jefferson County all my life. I'm a third generation Jefferson County resident, except for two years in Pasadena, California when I was a teenager. I think the best way for me to introduce myself related to Rocky Flats is I'll just read paragraph or two from my chapter in Kristen Iverson's upcoming book. She has a book coming out in May called Doom with a View, and it's an anthology. Um, it has chapters by, it has 19 contributors and I'm one of them. So this is the final manuscript of my chapter. It's titled Deadly Development and the Radioactive Refuge, Building and Recreating on Plutonium Contaminated Land. So here's the introduction. Um, my first section is titled Rabbit Holes Research and Activism. Rocky Flats is a rabbit hole. My fall down it began with reading Kristen Iverson's Full Body Burden in 2012 and hasn't stopped since. I became obsessed with the issue, reading every book, watching every documentary, and listening to every interview about it. I've delved into deeper research, reviewing special collections and archives at the University of Colorado Boulder Library from the first scientist to raise alarms about Rocky Flats, making Freedom of Information Act requests to the Department of Energy, and visiting the Federal Record Center and U.S. District Court Clerk's Office, all to obtain rare reports and court case exhibits related to off-site Rocky Flats contamination and its consequences. And I'll just mention that um, Dr. Moore donated many boxes of his personal records to the CU Norland Library Special Collections and Archives Unit, and it was really fantastic. I spent like three weeks there going through original files of, um, well, Carl Johnson, Ed Martell, Jock Cobb, um, Leroy Moore, and others. Th these were their personal files that they'd collected. And back in, back in these times, the 70s, um, a lot of it was 70s, you know, there was an email, um, at least outside of ARPA, and so these people would type letters to each other, and so you'd have collections of letters. I anyways, I like to research, so um, one more paragraph. As a 50-something third-generation Jefferson County resident, I'd always been vaguely aware of the place in a background kind of way. I knew my aunt worked there. I remember the hippies, as I regarded them during my high school and college years, protesting it. Later, my biking routes would take me up Indiana Street, bordering the site on the east, but I was as ignorant of the contamination as I'd been of those people's heroic activism. I saw metal sheds and equipment in the fields and accurately suspected they were for air and water monitoring without grasping the implications. Only after going down the rabbit hole did I begin to understand the complexity and the horror of Rocky Flats. Amusingly, I became what I'd dismissed before, an activist, though I prefer research and direct persuasion of decision makers to public protest. Um, I guess one more sentence. Two government plans moved me to oppose actions I regard so dangerous to public health that I'm dumbfounded by our officials' lack of moral responsibility. The first was to open the Rocky Flats National Wildlife Refuge to the public on September 15, 2018. The other is to build the Jefferson Parkway along the site's eastern border. That's the start of my chapter in Doom with a View. And I have a sort of a unique characteristic, which is that my uncle John Martin spent his career in the Fish and Wildlife Service um, as a refuge manager, and he was the manager of the Alaska Maritime Wildlife Refuge. Um, he lived on Adak Island in the Aleutians for several decades, and I actually visited him there in 1976. And there's an island in the Aleutians called Amchitka, which was the site of underground nuclear weapons testing in the late 60s and early 70s. And that's actually where Greenpeace was founded, by the way. Um, anyway, um, the Fish and Wildlife Service had operations on Amchitka after the tests. They, they were rehabilitating a, an endangered species of goose there. So they had employees living on Amchitka and actually employees' families living on Amchitka. And a lot of those people and their family members got cancer later in life. And so <clears throat> my first act of uh, civic engagement or, or, or public activism was in, in the summer of 2017, 
Fish and Wildlife Service here began putting on these quote-unquote sharing sessions to talk about their plans for the refuge. They held a series of four of them, public forums, but they, it was a one-way information flow. Um, people weren't really allowed to, well, they weren't public policy meetings, and, and attendees weren't really allowed to make input. They were only allowed to receive plans. So I met David Lucas, who's the manager of the Rocky Flats National Wildlife Refuge, and I told him this story about my Uncle John and Amchitka and what happened to the Fish and Wildlife employees there. And I wrote, I wrote him a letter, a um, three or four page letter, um, basically pleading with him, it's not too late you know, to, to close the refuge. I never got a response. So, so I, my, and furthermore, my Uncle John gave me kind of an impassioned opinion. I asked him, well, what do you think of the federal government or the Fish and Wildlife Service um, turning former DOE sites into uh, refuges? And he wrote back and said, well, you've hit a pet peeve of mine. He said, uh, I think the agency that screwed up the land should be required to keep it and fence it and patrol it and put signage on it so that people don't get the idea that it's a perfectly safe place to go horseback riding. Here are the topics in here, just a little introduction and context. I want to talk about the well-established fact of the plutonium contamination. It's, that is not disputed, it, it is fact. I want to talk about the evidence of a public health risk um, around Rocky Flats, and I want to talk about how our governments really at all levels are exacerbating this problem. Um, and, and then I want to, uh, just a few words about what you can do if you're so inclined. We have a, a very local and very unique problem here with national implications, and that's because there's no place anywhere else in America like Rocky Flats in terms of proximity to a metropolitan area, um, upwind and upslope location of a populated area, the, the mission and the history of Rocky Flats. It, it's the only facility in the history of United States that produced the plutonium cores for our nuclear arsenal, 70,000 plutonium cores, and it had a kind of a unique cocktail of contamination into the environment. Plutonium, americium, volatile organic compounds, beryllium, um, a variety of things. And the reason it has national implications is because uh, of uh, What's happening at Rocky Flats is, is actually, I think, being regarded as a precedent for what could happen at other sites around the country, um, turning, the, turning these places into wildlife refuges. And so we don't, we don't want the world to think this is a great idea. Um, and and at, at a more local level, people are moving here and they're buying expensive houses. You know, real estate in Candelas and other neighborhoods along Indiana Street is half a million to a million dollars, and they have no idea, like, like you folks, and they're, they're getting sick um, in some cases, and, and dying actually, and, and having their lives hugely impacted. So, um, and, and the refuge is open to the public. You can go mountain bike or hike or whatever on the refuge in plutonium contaminated soil, and the Jefferson Parkway is imminent, and then new development occurs constantly. Just just a couple months ago, Broomfield City Council was asked to approve a proposed new neighborhood um, just east of Indiana Street, which would be another residential area disturbing contaminated soil. Here's the big picture view. Um, so we are way up here off the corner, off the northwest corner. Um, this is Indiana Street right here. Um, this is Highway 128 going across to Wadsworth. Um, Wadsworth a little farther over. This is Highway 72 down here. The Cold War Horse is right in here somewhere. This is Highway 93 from Golden to Boulder. So this big square right here is the general area. So this weird shaped gray area is still the Superfund site, the Department of Energy retained area. And the green part around it is the refuge. It's formerly the buffer zone of the weapons plant. And together those two, the gray and green areas together comprised the official plant site. It was Department of Energy land altogether. Um, the buffer zone was actually expanded in 1975 in response to some of these studies that 
Dr. Moore referred to. Um, it didn't used to be as big. And importantly, there was absolutely no cleanup whatsoever in this green area or off-site. Um, the only quote-unquote cleanup was in this gray area. So let's talk about the fact of the contamination. Um, this is the well-known Cray Hardy map. The original version was black and white. This is an enhanced version that was created for the Cook versus Rockwell lawsuit. Um, and the original version had another isopleth uh, farther out from here, went all the way down to 64th Avenue in, in Arvada. Um, and these, the, these are units of becquerels per square meter. If you really get into this, you'll find different units, picocuries per gram, becquerels per square meter, what have you. This is a diagram I made of all of the different soil studies over the years and the letter indicates where a sample was taken, and the color indicates the multiple of background radiation um, in that sample. The first one was Martell and Poet. Um, Dr. Moore already talked about that. There was this fire in Mother's Day 1969. Ed Martell up at NCAR could see the smoke, started asking questions, didn't get answers, so he, he had the wherewithal, the knowledge to do his own study, and he found, um, you know, 300 times background hot spots right here west of Indiana and some lower multiple hot spots in other places all the way up to 2012 in a study that Dr. Moore commissioned the Rocky Mountain Peace and Justice Center hired a guy named Marco Kaltofen who found um, what are we looking for K so he was finding greater than 100 times background radiation in certain places and so th these are, this is uh, 10 studies over a period of half a century by a variety of different people, government, academia, independent, all finding multiples of background radiation of, well, up to 500 times. This, this dark sea here is from Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment report in 2013. They had, they had their own plutonium isopleth line here, that, which was 500 times background, just, just west of Indiana. Dr. Moore was a first-hand participant in the process of trying to determine what, what is a safe level of radioactivity in the soil. And the, 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 ultimately, the standard that was chosen by, for Rocky Flats cleanup was 50 picocuries per gram, which is, which is um, let me just... Let me just do a quick calculation. I always use uh, Ed Martell's number for background. Do you guys know what I mean by background? Okay, let me tell you what I mean by background. Um, in the 50s and 60s, the United States and other countries exploded atomic weapons in various places around the world for testing. You know, Bikini Atoll in the Pacific, Amchitka, whatever. And those, those explosions <laughs> released radioactive particles into the atmosphere and they blew around the world and settled everywhere. There's, there's plutonium particles out here in Leroy's front yard probably. When I say background I mean what is the background radiation on the Colorado Front Range from atmospheric nuclear weapons testing in the past mm -hmm. and Dr. Martell measured it at um, 0.0434 disintegrations per minute per gram. So 50 mm -hmm. picocuries per gram is itself 2,557 times background. So the, the EPA thinks that's safe. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to show you reasons why I think that's not safe. And then, oh, so that's on the west side of Indiana, that's the standard, 50 picocuries per gram. On the east side of Indiana, where it's not federal land, there's a state standard that applies. And the state standard is 2.0 disintegrations per minute per gram, which is only like 50 times background. And if, if there's soil that exceeds that level of contamination, then people are supposed to use special construction techniques to build in it, but those are kind of unspecified. Still on the fact of the contamination, this little screen capture right here is from CDPHE's own website um, talking about plutonium in the refuge, and they, they admit 19 picocuries per gram, which is almost a thousand times background. And I think that's probably just east of the 903 pad. Let me, sorry, I'm going to back up a second. So 
in the Superfund site, there, there was this little area right about here, in the sort of the southeast corner of the industrial area called the 903 pad. And it, for about at least a decade, maybe 15 years, in the late 50s and 60s, Dow Chemical was stacking up these 55-gallon drums of oil from the lathes in, in the plant. That they, they basically, they were turning metal parts and shaving them into certain shapes and stuff. Well, and, and they had oil to cool the lathes, and that oil became contaminated with little plutonium chips from the lathing process. And they accumulated 5,000 barrels of contaminated oil, and they stacked them up in this field, just out in the open. And the, the barrels rusted, and the oil leaked out into the ground, and, it, and the plutonium too, and it blew, because the, the prevailing wind direction up there is out of the north, basically out of the west with a little northerly component, so it's like this. So the most heavily contaminated ground is over here, south-southeast of the 903 pad. I kind of think that's probably where that sample was taken, they don't tell you. And then the Colorado Department of Transportation did an environmental impact study um, when they were getting ready, you know, it's kind of one of the steps that led to the Jefferson Parkway. And they said in their report that plutonium concentrations in surface soil in the vicinity of Indiana Street range to 10 picocuries per gram, which is 500 times background. So here are two different state departments acknowledging the contamination there. It's, it's not disputed. Okay, now here's the really interesting part. This past summer, 2019, was the first time since Marco Kaltofen in 2012 that there has been any sampling done out there. And th so there was sampling done for the Jefferson Parkway. They found a 264 picocurie per gram hotspot in the Parkway right-of-way, this little yellow strip, you know, right, right about here. This is the old Eastgate access road. So right about here, they found a, about a nine micron particle of pure plutonium dioxide. A, a, um, a human hair is like 50 microns. This is about one fifth the width of a human hair. Pure plutonium particle re <coughs> registering 264 picocuries per gram of radioactivity. That's 13,500 times background. And that's, that's five times the level that was allowed by the Rocky Flats cleanup. So that was the most significant finding. There, there's also sampling for the Rocky Mountain Greenway Trail, which I didn't talk about, but um, this is the Rocky Mountain Greenway Trail proposal. There's an idea to connect all these refuges on the Front Range and ultimately connect them to Estes Park with this Rocky Mountain Greenway Trail, and it's going to go through the quote-unquote windblown area exposure unit east of the 903 pad, which is the most heavily contaminated. So. This, this is going to be open for public recreation and trail construction and so on. Um, and that's right where they found that screaming hot particle. About six local governments, City of Boulder, County of Boulder, Arvada, Westminster, Broomfield, Jefferson County, uh, pooled their money to apply for a federal grant to build uh, crossings of these roads for this trail. So they're, there's going to be an overpass across Indiana here, and there's going to be an underpass across under 128 here. And these local governments said, all right, if we're going to put our money into this grant application, we want soil sampling first, um, and we're going to make our contribution contingent on successful soil sampling results for, for some definition of success. Okay, so the Greenway Trail sampling... Um, results came back and they found a, a 14 picocurie per gram hot spot east of Indiana. That's 716 times background. Our friend Dr. Michael Ketterer um, got a permission from Jefferson County to go collect his own independent samples in the right-of-way. And here's, this is actually a very important point. He found um, a little plutonium particle that was 3 microns and it only registered 138 times background he could tell that it's 100% Rocky Flats origin because of the ratio of plutonium 239 to 240 atoms. The amount of radioactivity from any one particle is not really the issue. The issue is the fact that these particles exist. They can be suspended in the air and they can be breathed. You saw the little starburst thing in the ape lung. All the sampling that happened this summer confirms previous results and actually exceeds them. 
And plutonium-239 has a half-life of 24,000 years, so it's going to take a quarter million years for this stuff to decay away to the point where it's not a threat anymore. So I actually had to update my little diagram to put in the locations of all these findings, and I had to invent new colors like very dark purple or black or something for 10,000 times background. The contamination is fact. It's, it's there. All right, what about the evidence of public health risk? And I know this, this came up a little earlier. Um, a federal government organization called the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry. They're actually associated with the Centers for Disease Control. And they, this agency was created by the CERCLA legislation, the Superfund legislation. So they maintain what they call a toxicological profile document for every toxin known to man. And their toxicological profile document for plutonium says, if you breathe air that contains plutonium, some of it will get trapped in your lungs. Some of the trapped plutonium will move to other parts of your body, mainly your bones and liver. And if plutonium were, entered, were to enter your lungs today, much of the plutonium would still be in your body 30 to 50 years later. And it also says that cancer is the most latent, is, is the major latent harmful effect produced by ionizing radiation and the one that most people exposed to radiation are concerned about. The ability of radiation of various kinds to produce cancer in every tissue has, has been demonstrated in laboratory animals. It's not an immediate effect. Um, it has latency periods of two to greater than 20 years. Exposure can produce cancer at any site in the body. Um, however, some sites are more common, such as breast, lung, stomach, and thyroid. This is the federal government speaking. Okay. So part of my research, and I forgot to mention, um, I volunteered and served on the Jefferson Parkway Advisory Committee, which was a citizen's advisory committee established by the Jefferson Parkway Public Highway Authority Board of Directors. And my reason for getting on it was I wanted to advise the Board of Directors of the potential public health risk of this project, which I was eventually able to do. But I did all this research on past soil studies and past public health studies for that purpose. But ultimately, I, I wrote this position paper for the, my peers on the advisory committee. Well. So when you look at all the public health studies that have been done, the first one was Dr. Carl Johnson, former Jefferson County Public Health Director. He found 24% 20 more cancer in people nearer Rocky Flats than farther away. So what he did was he took those isopleth lines of different colors from Cray and Hardy, and he basically studied what's the cancer incidence in the closest one versus the cancer incidence in the farthest away one, and he found 24% more cancer closer than farther away. Then there was an earlier lawsuit before Cook versus Rockwell called um, Church versus United States, and a, a physicist and statistician working for plaintiff's counsel named Stephen Chin, he found that the most important factors in the increased cancer incidence were the direction you lived from the plant, with directly downwind being worst, and the distance from the plant, with you know closest being worst. He used the same data as Carl Johnson. They were studying cancer incidents from, I want to say, 1969 to 1971. It's a pretty narrow, pretty narrow period. Well, then there was a man, actually a CU professor, John Cobb, who he, he ran the public health department at the CU School of Medicine. And he did an experiment where he found um, Rocky Flats specific plutonium by isotope ratio in the lungs and liver tissue of deceased downwinders. And he, he compared it against a control population, people from Pueblo, who weren't exposed to Rocky Flats plutonium. The important thing was these, these downwinders had Rocky Flats specific plutonium in their lungs and livers. How did it get there? How, how did it get there? It uh, shouldn't have been there. Then there was a guy named Richard Clapp, who was a very qualified epidemiologist. He was um, he had an SCD, which is the equivalent of a PhD, in epidemiology, and he was formerly director of the Massachusetts Cancer Registry. And he was an expert witness in Cook versus Rockwell. That was a class action lawsuit that you may have heard about that paid out just two summers ago, $375 million payout. Well, anyhow, he did, his, he did a study on later data. I think he, he analyzed data up through 1995 or so. 
and he found 29% more lung cancer and 90% more bone cancer closer to Rocky Flats than farther away. And then there, were, then there was a, a DOE-funded study by a guy named Kenny Crump who replicated Johnson's results, but then he applied this quote-unquote urbanization adjustment where he, he measured how far the cancer victim lived from the state capital and it skewed his results. And he was later criticized by Clapp for doing that. And I, I kind of discount that one because it was methodologically flawed and funded by DOE. And then our own Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment has done studies which are also methodologically flawed, and Dr. Moore has criticized them sharply. They, CDPHE considers areas like Thornton and Niwot to be near Rocky Flats. <laughs> so if you look at um, right around Stanley Lake compared to Cherry Creek Reservoir, you're going to get a sharp contrast. You know, if you, if you consider half of the northwest metro area to be near Rocky Flats and compare it to the southeast metro area, you're not going to get that much contrast because you're diluting the incidence. And that's what CDPHE did. So then we have Tiffany's study, the Metropolitan, Health, Metropolitan State University Health Survey. This was a self-selecting population, so it's not statistically valid, but she had, she had 1,745 respondents and of those 848 cases of cancer, and of those, half were quote-unquote rare cancers, meaning there were fewer than 15 cases per 100,000 people. That's the definition of a rare cancer. Mm -hmm. Well, the national rate for rare cancers is 25%. So we have twice the rate of rare cancers around here than nationally. Furthermore, um, whoops, nationally thyroid cancer is ninth most prevalent but here it's second most prevalent and the thyroid's a radiosensitive organ. So even though this wasn't a statistically valid, it, it wasn't an epidemiological study, but it, it, it had some interesting findings that demonstrate the need for a proper epidemiological study. And they produced these geoplots. This is from Tiffany's study. So in this one, in both of them, the dots the black dots are the addresses of the respondents, and I, I think maybe just the respondents that reported cancer. In, in the one on the left, this is the smoke plume path from the 1950, 1957 fire. So there was a bad fire at Rocky Flats in 1957, and it blew a cloud of radioactive smoke over Denver for 13 hours. And this, this one is the Cray Hardy map, so you can see the different isopleths with different intensity of colors. And I just thought these geoplots were really striking visual evidence of the correlation of the survey respondents to these contamination events. And then more recently, there's a young woman named Brittany Kelly who is a victim of breast cancer at a young age. She developed breast cancer, I think, in her early 30s. And uh, young breast cancer is defined as um, breast cancer in a woman who's less than 40 years old. And Supposedly only 5% of breast cancer diagnoses are made in women that young out of all breast cancer diagnoses. Well, so she started voluntarily collecting reports of young breast cancer victims in Colorado. Um, and you can see the clustering around Stanley Lake. I mean, this leftmost picture goes all the way from Colorado Springs to Fort Collins, I think. And then it zooms in, zooms in, zooms in. But obviously, there's something going on around Stanley Lake. <laughs> a couple of years ago, there was a woman named Danny Ball who started collecting data on epilepsy incidents. Um, and in some cases, um, she found families where multiple siblings had epilepsy and there was no family history. Um, my daughter has epilepsy, and it's not, there doesn't need to be a family history. Um, in my daughter's case, it was caused by a little birth defect in her brain, but then I got to wondering how'd she get a birth defect in her brain. But anyway, um, citizens, unfortunately, are having to collect this data, you know, Tiffany, Brittany, Danny Ball, because CDPHE isn't, isn't, isn't doing it well enough. Then there's the anecdotal evidence. So there's the two cases of cardiac angiosarcoma in Five Parks, which is a neighborhood of 1,600 people. And this cancer is so rare that um, only 25 cases per year 
are diagnosed nationally, I think, in 50 cases per year globally. I may be off by even two or three orders of magnitude, it doesn't matter. Here we have a neighborhood of 1,600 people with two cases. Um, and then the next neighborhood to the north of Five Parks, Whisper Creek, there have been three men in their 40s who have died of abdominal cancers. Um, and Tiffany knows these cases, and their doctors described the cases as anomalies, and one of them blamed Rocky Flats. Um, both these neighborhoods, Five Parks and Whisper Creek, are, are new. They were built in the last 15 years. Um, Whisper Creek was probably just getting started being built when the quote-unquote cleanup was finished. Um, and furthermore, there's been there's a dog park um, just east of there, and, and there's a Denver Post article about a veterinarian reporting high incidence of cancer in dogs in his practice. So th this is anecdotal evidence. So we've been through epidemiological studies, a couple of citizen-led studies, and then anecdotal evidence. But to me, um, you know, the, go the government is basing its assertion that the area is safe on this software package called ResRad, residual radiation. And ResRad was developed and maintained by Argonne Labs, Argonne National Labs. It's, it's closed source. I actually, I'm a software architect, and I wanted to look at the source of this program to see how's it making its conclusions, but you can't, it's not open source. What ResRed does is you put in some parameters about here's the amount of contamination and here are some assumptions about exposure, like a, a wildlife refuge worker will be on the site for 40 hours a week and a refuge visitor will be on the site for two hours one day of their life and it spits out an excess cancer incidence estimate of one in 100 million population or whatever the number is. What's happened in five parks alone demonstrates the in invalidity, in my view, of ResRed. I mean, you have two heart cancer cases in a 1,600-person neighborhood. Um, and so this subject came up earlier of um, what's the smoking gun linkage, right? So Dr. Michael Ketterer, who is a, um, a chemist um, who specializes in radionuclide soil study, He's emer he has emeritus status at Northern Arizona University, and he's currently teaching at Denver University. Um, he has the, the laboratories and the equipment, um, fancy mass spectrometers, to, um, well, to, to find plutonium in soil. But he is also working on a capability to analyze human tissue for plutonium. And the, the tricky part is, um, how do you take, let's say, an excised tumor, excised primary tumor, it has to be primary tumor, and um, reduce it down to a little vial of serum that he can put in his mass spectrometer. That's the tricky part. And he's talking about validation tests like, you know, going down to the store and buying some steak and injecting it with plutonium and then running it through his process and seeing if he can find the plutonium. The capability's not ready yet. All he needs is funding. Um, but it, it is it is possible, and there's actually a precedent for this. Um, in the movie Dark Circle, there's a man named uh, uh, Lloyd Mixon who says he had a tu an extracted tumor analyzed for rocky flats plutonium with positive findings. And in, the, in Full Body Burden, um, Kristen Iverson describes a girl named um, Kristen Haig, whose father built the Iverson's house. She died of bone cancer, and her family had her ashes, her cremated ashes tested for rocky flats plutonium with positive findings. So there, there, there is precedent for this kind of study. So if you really want to be technical about it, you would have to analyze excised plutonium or excised tumor tissue from other people. Or what, what's the story? Um, you'd have to have a control group somehow. So, you, but, but to me, if, if it, well, <laughs> I'm jumping around, but you, men you mentioned Benny Abbott. Benny Abbott had a double mastectomy in 1984 or something uh, for breast cancer, and she preserved her breast tissue for 25 years or however long it's been. And she actually gave it to um, Dr. Sasha Stiles. And was, that's not the only tissue sample that uh, Dr. Stiles has in custody awaiting Dr. Ketterer's capability. So, if you have a person who had cancer and you have an excised primary tumor and you find Rocky Flats spe specific plutonium in it by isotope ratio, to me that's smoking gun. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
even if there's no control group. The chemistry is possible. All it would take is the political will, to, but CDPHE doesn't have the political will. How government is exacerbating the problem, yeah, this is a good one. Um, first, there's the wildlife refuge. It opened to public in September 2018. Um, you can go ride your mountain bike, uh, whatever. Um, to me, the off-site tracking of contamination makes it a public policy issue. You know, I, I get every time there's an article in the Denver Post about something like this, you'll see people making comments, and I'll make comments, and you get into these comment wars. And, and you know, if, if somebody wants to go play in plutonium, give them a Darwin Award. I don't care. You know, they shouldn't reproduce anyway. However. <clears throat> Let's say they bring their bike into some bike shop, or let's say they bring their 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 horse, their their tack, or their horseshoes, or whatever, someplace. Let's say they walk into the local Starbucks with their hiking boots on. They could be tracking plutonium in there, and that makes it a public policy issue. And then there's the whole question of um, accidents and first responders in local medical facilities. Let, let's say somebody falls from a horse or bike and breaks a bone and they have to be hilly vacked out of there and you have a helicopter stirring up dust and the, the, the medical people who respond, you know, do they have the respirators they need and all that stuff and, you know, what happens when that person's clothes get cut off in the emergency room, they might have plutonium on their clothes, I don't know. Um, I don't think these questions have really been thought about in, in detail. And then there's the whole thing about fish and wildlife planning to construct uh, trails and visitor center, which implies more soil disturbance. This picture was taken by Drake Panzer, Nathan's brother, um, July 4th, uh, 2018 or 19, I can't remember. That is a dust devil on the refuge. Um, so I believe this, these houses you see here are in, are in Whisper Creek. This was taken from the south shore of Stanley Lake looking northwest, basically. And I looked up the wind on this day and it was, that wasn't more than 25 miles an hour uh, of wind. You know, earlier today, we were having gusts at my house, probably 50 miles an hour. So this is 25 miles an hour wind raising dust up on the refuge and over here. And that dust may contain plutonium dioxide particles. So if you were in the middle of this dust devil and you were breathing hard, you could end up with one of those little starbursts in your lungs. And um, so the... It's not, I don't think it's really wise to, for the government to allow people to be out there. Second thing is the Greenway Trail, which we kind of already discussed. They're routing it right through the worst part, um, strangely. So here's, this, this picture shows the former industrial area. So the 903 pad was right about here. Um, and then there's all the development. So this is um, Google Earth time lapse. It only goes back to 1984, but here, here the plant was operating. You can see the former industrial area. Um, 2016, so that's 24 years later, or 34 years later, um, it's, been, it's been demolished, but you can still see where it was. And when you look around Stanley Lake, like the north shore of Stanley <laughs> Lake, there's all this housing that's gone in here. There's all this housing that's gone in on the south um, south side of Stanley Lake. Candelas is being developed, obviously. Th this is Leiden Rock right here. This is Candelas. Um, here's Whisper Creek, and here's Five Parks. So there, and there's new neighborhoods in Broomfield. This, this neighborhood right here is Skystone, and it is about two and a half miles due east of the 903 pad. So this is down to... Um, like planning and zoning departments in Arvada, Jefferson County, and Broomfield. They just don't care. You know, the, um, and if you, if you superimpose the Cray Hardy map on this, um, some of these areas are more than the state standard of, of um, plutonium. They're more than two disintegrations per minute per gram. So, the, you know, I could, I could, once I get warmed up, I could talk about this a lot. So uh, I actually spoke with uh, Doug Young, who was the staffer for Congressman Mark Udall at the time when the Rocky Flats National Wildlife Refuge Act was written, 2001. And Doug Young actually wrote the legislation. He wrote the bill. And the reason I called him or I wanted to speak with him, I wanted to ask him, how did there get to be a transportation right-of-way in this Refuge Act? And he kind of told me the whole history of the Refuge Act. 
he told me that when Rocky Flats closed, when, when the mission changed from plutonium pit production to closure, um, there was a debate about what would become of this land. And Wayne Allard, not Wayne Allard, Mark Udall, um, did not want, he wanted the land to be preserved as open land somehow, because he knew this would happen. He knew that if they didn't try to preserve it somehow, that development would creep over there. Because there's a, there's a pr pretty prominent guy in all this history named Charlie McKay. He's the nephew of Marcus Church. Um, church Ranch Road is named after the church family. They were a homesteading family that ranched. Their, their land was appropriated by the government to build Rocky Flats. Well, the, the churches in McKay's have been dead set on developing their land for profit for like half a century. And they're not the only ones. So the, the developers don't care, obviously. Cand Candelas is a church family development. Whisper Creek is a church family development. This, the planning and zoning de departments don't care. So we're going to have more Panzers and McNeely's if, if this whole thing continues. Now my personal favorite, the Jefferson Parkway. Okay, so this is the fourth attempt to complete the beltway around Denver. We have from 9 o'clock to 12 o'clock roughly. Or we have, what is it? We have from 8 o'clock to 11 o'clock, something like that. That last chunk is the Jefferson Parkway. So for a number of dubious reasons, it's routed right up Indiana Street, right through all that contamination. And this is a picture I took in April of 2018 down on C470 where I live. Um, and there was a dump truck and a bulldozer up here and driving along, and, and they were raising all this dust into the air. And that's what will happen with um, Jefferson Parkway construction. You know that Indiana is kind of hilly. They're talking about uh, cut and fill construction techniques. So convoys of earth movers cutting the hills and filling the valleys. And here's the prevailing wind direction. And all that construction would blow dust like this down here. Um, and it's, in my view, a, a very dangerous public health risk. Well, here's the good news, Leroy. I think you were waiting for this. We have been, we the community, have been engaged with the local governments that are partnered in the Jefferson Parkway since December 2018. Um, Leroy has a young man working at a Rocky Mountain Peace and Justice Center named Chris Allred, and he discovered that uh, a Broomfield City Council meeting agenda in December of 18 had an item on it to where, where Jefferson Parkway Public Highway Authority was asking Broomfield for 2.5 or 2.1 million extra dollars for 2019. JPPHA asked Broomfield, Arvada, and Jefferson County, all three partners, for an extra 2.1 million dollars that year for a total of 6.3 million dollars because they needed it to run their procurement process. You know, they needed to release a request for proposal and get the bids back and, 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 so, and evaluate the bids and so on. Well, we intervened in Broomfield <laughs> um, successfully. Um, so it dragged on and on. It lasted all of 2019, but um, we had this big meeting on June 18th, and, and I, I kind of coordinated some people to come talk, and the other side talked, you know, CDPHE and all the development interests, you know, Jefferson County Economic Development Center. Um, well, the, the Broomfield City Council never voted last year on that $2.1 million. They just kept delaying, delaying, delaying. And then the elections happened. And Broomfield is a, a hotbed of progressivism. I mean, who knew, right? But <laughs> those, those people, are they're pissed about fracking, and they're pissed about the Jefferson Parkway. So tomorrow night... Um, they have an item on their agenda, uh, a resolution to um, send a, a letter of intent to withdraw from Jefferson Parkway Public Highway Authority. The, the resolution will pass by an 8 to 2 or 9 to 1 vote. Um, we don't know what will happen next, to be honest, because if you look at the establishing contract for the Jefferson Parkway Public Highway Authority, it says that a partner may withdraw if there's unanimous consent from the board. 
and the board is made up of two people from Arvada who are pro Parkway. Mm -hmm. uh, one, one Jeff co-commissioner, Libby Zabo, and then the two from Broomfield. Um, so I don't know, but let's say Broomfield successfully withdraws from JPPHA. That means that Arvada and Jeffco have to pay one-sixth more each now of the costs because he's taken one-third of the funding source away. Well, Jefferson County um, has a $16 million budget shortfall this year because they had it. You guys know what debrucing is? Douglas Bruce, conservative guy from Colorado Springs, early 90s, managed to get legislation passed at the state level called TABOR, Taxpayer Bill of Rights. Oh, yeah. So Taxpayer Bill of Rights really handcuffs municipalities. If they, if they collect more tax revenue than some formula says, they have to give it back to the taxpayers. Mm -hmm. And so it's, these debrucing ballot initiatives have been popular for a while. Like, and Jefferson County tried to debruce, which means we don't have to give our excess tax back. Well, the debrucing measure failed. So Jefferson County had to give its excess tax back. And as a result, they have a really serious budget problem in 2020. They're closing jail floors. They're, they're letting inmates go. They are contemplating closing their fairgrounds. I mean, it's serious. They can't afford this. And we've been, it, we've been engaged with Jefferson County as well. I, every time something happens in Broomfield, I forward it to Jefferson County commissioners. And it's my hope that... Jefferson County will say, okay, that's it. You know, if, if Broomfield's out, we're out. And then that just leaves Arvada, and they can't do it alone. So I hope that we'll be able to kill this whole project um, by civic engagement. And it's been, it's been really fulfilling for me. Um, I've been in the middle of it. Well, I got in the middle of it starting in September of 17 when I applied to be on the Jefferson Parkway Advisory Committee. Then I wrote that position paper with all my research findings. Then Kristen Iverson invited me to contribute a chapter to her book. Then Broomfield City Council backed out, and it's been good. Um, yeah, what a victory. So what can you do? Well, first, you can educate yourself, what you're doing, obviously. Thank you so much. It's great to see your generation getting a glimpse of all this <sighs> drama. Um, so Kristen Iverson's Full Body Burden is really wonderful. Um, there's, a, there's a book called The Ambush Grand Jury, which was written by Wes McKinley, was the foreman of the special grand jury that was impaneled to weigh the evidence collected by the FBI raid in 1989. That jury met for three years. They wanted to indict individuals at DOE and Rockwell, not just the companies, but actual executives. But there was a plea bargain, or well, there was a deal made by, I always forget his name. It was a district attorney at the time, Mike, Nor Mike Norton. Mike Norton made, cut, a, cut a backroom deal, and Rockwell ended up getting an $18 million fine, which was less than their profit from running Rocky Flats that year. There's, there's a book called Making a Real Killing by Len Ackland, which is really good history, a lot of church family history. Um, if you want like the historical context of how did Colorado get Rocky Flats, it's in there, my position paper. So what else can you do? Now, now we need to turn our attention to Jefferson County. I think we're, we're winning in Broomfield. We need to convince Jefferson County to bail out. Um, tell them you're concerned about the public health risk. Um, tell them you have no confidence in CDPHE. Um, and then finally, uh, don't visit the refuge on windy days. Don't, don't be anywhere near it. And um, if you know any sick down winders, put them in touch with Tiffany. And that's the end of my thing. Why do CDPHE's cancer incidence studies about Rocky Flats include areas that are 16 miles away and not downwind? That's question number one. Why has CDPHE never conducted a health monitoring program of the population around Rocky Flats? They, what they have done is um, supposedly retrospective case-controlled epidemiological studies, but they could take 
Candelas or Five Parks or Whisper Creek and just monitor those people's health. Put in some kind of a system where everything from a common cold to a cardiac angiosarcoma case gets reported. If, if, they're, if they're at all concerned about this public health risk, why are they not monitoring? That was actually one of the things the plaintiff class in Cook v. Rockwell sued for. They, they wanted health monitoring. Why have they not studied other conditions besides cancer, neurological diseases like Parkinson's, epilepsy, thyroid diseases? City and County of Broomfield made the Department of Energy give them a new water supply back in the, the 90s, I think. Rocky Flats contaminated Broomfield's water supply. In order to offer political compromise, I, I took the position with lobbying Broomfield that just ask for realignment of the parkway. It's really the alignment up Indiana Street that's dangerous. So they could put it west of, high, uh, they could put it up Highway 93 and across Highway 128. I don't have a problem with that, except economically, I'm not sure it's viable. In, in fact, uh, um, one of the three companies that was qualified to bid on the project withdrew. And one of the reasons they withdrew is because their internal analyses showed that the cost of building and operating the, park, the parkway wouldn't be made up for by the toll revenue. As a Jefferson County taxpayer, I have a, a small dog in that fight, but my big concern was the public health risk. Um, I, I understand that Boulder would not want uh, routing up Highway 93 because they're trying to keep that open. Um, they, own, they own a lot of open space on the west side of 93. So that would, and if, if JPPHA wanted to pursue that, it would be like starting over. They've already acquired right of way. Uh, they, they would have to do all the engineering and planning to route it that way. They'd be totally starting over, which would mean they'd need another, I don't know, 10 or $20 million and nobody has it. Not that I know of, but it's really an interesting question. So my wife, my wife's family lived at 32nd and Kipling, if you know where that is, um, Crown Hill kind of area, for 50 years. And my, my father-in-law's a leukemia survivor. He loves to garden. He's out in his yard all year. And so when you look at that 1957 smoke plume, mm -hmm. it came south, and I think, well, and it, and it eventually turned up the Platte Valley, but I think it hit that ridge at 32nd and Wheat Ridge and <laughs> dropped stuff. Yeah. Um, so my, my, fa my father-in-law is a leukemia survivor, with, and he also has epilepsy. My mother-in-law has Parkinson's. My wife has what's called the downwinder scar. She had some kind of cyst removed from her neck when she, about 20 years ago. And she had this really weird presentation a couple of years ago that we thought was going to be multiple sclerosis. She, she had like her spinal fluid testing, and, it, and a diagnosis was never made. And eventually it cleared up and we never knew what it was. It was like an autoimmune disorder presentation. And, and, and then our daughter has, she had a little piece of her right occipital lobe that didn't like fully flower out and form into like normal looking brain tissue. And that's where her seizures originate is in her right occipital lobe. So I got to wondering what, how the heck, well, um, there's, there's this whole thing called epigenetics uh, yeah, um, yeah. about how um, genetic mutations are transferred from one generation to the next. Just made me wonder, like, could my wife's issues have been caused by? No, I guess they couldn't, because she was born. She was born before her parents lived there. But there have been, there have been other anecdotal reports. The, the street that Carl Johnson lived on, he Carl Johnson lived near 32nd and Kipling, in a neighborhood called Paramount Heights. And I, my good friend, who first gave me full body burden, lived on the same street. There were three cases of brain cancer on that street. And it, again, it's, it, so this friend's brother and I hired Dr. Ketterer to analyze their parents' cremation ashes mm -hmm. and uh, soil samples from their home because they had lived there for 50 years. And he, he found a um, sample of plutonium from these old junipers in their front yard that um, was of mixed origin, so part global fallout, part rocky flats. So it was confirmation that Rocky Flats plutonium got as far south as 32nd and Kipling. One of the interesting things to me is the high school classes. It's like Arvada West, Pomona, even Arvada. My mother's family grew up in Arvada, and the 57 fire happened on her 17th birthday. She was a junior at Arvada, and um, 
she's a breast cancer survivor living with one kidney. She had a kidney removed from cysts. If you get to talking to somebody who went to like Arvada West or Pomona or something in the 80s, they're like, oh yeah, you know, all my classmates are, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and that would be a, oh, that's the one I was trying to remember from CDPHE. That would be a really good study for CDPHE to do is like, just go high school class by high school class from this area and find out how many of the students in that class developed some disease and it, is that more or less than normal. After I read Full Body Burden, I got hooked it, and my aunt worked there for 15 years. She was a Q-cleared hands-on chemical operator in buildings 371 and 771. And when I read in Full Body Burden about the Jefferson Parkway, I thought, this, this is crazy, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. And so I just wanted to learn more and wanted to intervene. The reason decision at Rocky Flats is so important, it's, a, it's about the trial of the trespassers. Right. And they called in, the, the defense called in um, heavy duty witnesses, Alice Stewart, Carl Morgan, Carl Johnson, Ed Martell, Jock Cobb. All these guys were on the witness stand and they're being filmed. A lot of that generation is gone. Yeah. <clears throat> and they were like the first real people to raise alarms. Mm -hmm. And they were very qualified.